Uh, I was talking earlier, I mean, uh, now we're talking about efforts to sort of uh, get to grips with, with the proliferation, international proliferation of know-how, etc. on, 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 on uh, uh, dual use pro on on on, uh, uh, on other proliferation threats, but I will talk a little bit more about what are these threats here, and what we see actually, I mean, is is a changing situation. One thing I think is very important is that uh, while uh, traditionally uh, most of of uh, the high technology was controlled by North America and the Western uh, and Western Europe. Today, of course, I mean, you have a number of new actors worldwide. I mean, China, India, Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, a number of countries that actually also are developing high-tech, high-end products that actually can be used uh, uh, for, for, the for, for, for the production of, of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I, I, I'd like to note, actually, this is more anecdotal, but anyway, uh, so, uh, the European Union a few years ago imposed some restrictions on trade with, with Iran. And uh, if that was just by coincidence or well not, but to the extent that the European exports to Iran went down by this, the Chinese export to Iran went up by that. So it, it is very important that you have a worldwide focus on these matters, because if you do it on the, on, on the bilateral basis or European Union round basis, I mean, the, the consequences will be virtually nil, because today there are replacement goods that are available in the, in, in the international market. Another very important element is that we also have the non-state actors Non-state actors is sort of a travesty for, for terrorists, basically, that are seeking weapons and mass destruction related materials and new technologies. I mean, this is something we also need to contend with. This is sort of the states, uh, states with the stability that we at least uh, expect even from, from dictatorships that uh, there actually will be some stability and uh, non-use of weapons and mass destruction. But I mean, now we will also have, uh, we also need to contend with the non-state actors with the terrorist threats. And th in, th in another, another point is this lack of awareness. I mean, at universities, of course, we all talk about you at the university. We talk about academic freedom, a part of academic freedom, a very important element of academic freedom was also, of course, the exchange of views and know-how between universities around the world. And of course, I mean, this is what we're talking about here is uh, really very limited pockets of know-how, which is particularly sensitive, that we need to be very careful about who will get access to, to that. But we also have new high-tech companies that have developed uh, fabulous new products, and they are so keen on the technologies, they are so focused on these new uh, fabulous items they've developed that they sort of not really know that uh, these actually could be of a type that uh, uh, can be dangerous, that could help the production of weapons of mass destruction. And finally, change in trade patterns. I will get back to some of these uh, elements in the next few pictures. This, I think, is very symptomatic. I mean, to the extent that uh, our proliferation efforts have been more strenuous, more effective, we've also seen a move uh, where some years ago, of course, I mean, when you had the supply of these goods, you had an end user, it was a very direct link. And of course, I was very also then very easy to cut off. Then, of course, I mean, the uh, end user uh, established some kind of procurement organization. Once you sort of cut that way out, of course, then they start using various traders. And this, with the years, I mean, the supply network has become more and more complex. I mean, you use actually traders, not only one country, but in two or three countries. So, I mean, the sensitive goods, again, if we just say the end use is in Iran, this product might have passed through two or three different uh, traders and uh, uh, procurement organizations, etc., on its way. So, of course, I mean, our work is to stop these proliferation flows become more and more strenuous, more and more difficult to uphold because uh, the increasing ingenuity of, uh, of, 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 of these networks. I mean, even a country like the United States that have a, a sort of a worldwide verification or ver worldwide technological network, I mean, with technical officers at most of their embassies around the world, I mean, they detect a number of, of uh, uh, non-intended end users 
we don't have the same kind of situation. I mean, out, uh, so I'm just, uh, well, not always want to know what is sort of going on out there because, I mean, it's virtually impossible to have a full control of all this very complicated chain of, of supply to end user. But that is our, 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 our work and of course, I mean, there's, there is also an international network of uh, identification of, uh, the sus of suspect activities. And I mean, not mentioning any particular countries, I would still mention, I mean, two very well-known uh, countries which are being used for this kind of proliferation efforts is the United Arab Emirates and also Malaysia. And of course, I mean, for us, it is a matter of putting pit particular emphasis on controls on exports, not only to Iran, but also to these two countries. Oh. I'm sorry, but the picture, there should, there, should, there should be a picture here actually of a man, but that picture disappeared. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that because, I mean, uh, could you ask me, uh, does anyone know the name of A.Q. Khan? No. Anyway, anyone who is interested in uh, non-proliferation efforts should know this guy because this is a very typical example of how things can go wrong. I mean, this is a Pakistani man. A Pakistani man who worked in, 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 in a laboratory in, uh, in the Netherlands back in the 1960s, 70s. And actually, he used his time there to get a full understanding of, uh, get a full understanding of, of, of nuclear, uh, how, uh, the, the, of the nuclear processes, which he then went back to Pakistan and with some help from North Korea, actually was the father of the Pakistani nuclear bomb, which was then exploded back in 1998. On top of that, not only this proliferation effort, I mean, I'm talking about the census technologies, how they could be brought from a country like Netherlands, from Sweden, whatever, to, uh, in this case, Pakistan. On top of that, he was then at the head of further proliferation efforts. I mean, he's been supplying Iran with the know-how, he's supplying Libya with the know-how, he's supplying other countries with know-how as well. Uh, so this is sort of the danger with, 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 with this kind of proliferation uh, that's going on. And I'm sorry I could not show the picture of him, but anyway, you know his name anyway now and how things work. He looks rather innocent on the picture, as a matter of fact. He looks like a nice old gentleman, but uh, his uh, work can uh, result in the deaths of millions of people if worse comes to worse. This picture is better. I mean, here you can see in the text. But in a way, uh, these are sort of some of the new approaches that we are using. I mean, the 1540 process and decisions by, 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 you know, by, by the Security Council of Iran and, 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 uh, and uh, in North Korea. The European Union measure, we'll get back to that, is also something called the Proliferation Security Initiative. And use monitoring I've been talking about and industry awareness and financing I've also been talking about earlier. But anyway, this is something, a very a, a key issue because, I mean, this is something that has been decided by the European Union and, of course, all the European Union members have to uh, assess this. And I mean, what are the focus here? I mean, the uh, raising of awareness in business, scientific, academic circles, as, as I was talking about, is also a matter of uh, cooperation with third countries, spreading the word on what is uh, uh, proliferation, what are the risks in uh, trading, and how can we combat the proliferation of know-how, goods, etc. Uh, in terms of transfer financing and of course also what I was talking about the trade flows earlier. So these are various parts and I mean this goes uh, far beyond what is basic export controls but actually goes into the various elements of how the risk and I mean also underlines the need for the various Swedish agencies to cooperate to be as effective as possible in combating the proliferation flows. Uh, this is an initiative taken by George W. Bush. And of course, any initiative taken by George W. Bush was of course met with a uh, large number, of, quite a bit of skepticism. But uh, this initiative actually has survived uh, the demise of his presidency and is still very vibrant. And what this is all about is really that if you have any kind of suspect 
cargo that is being shipped either by plane or by ship. There is an international obligation today to actually board, uh, first of all, to allow, if, if it is your, 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 your vessel, country, a vessel from Sweden, for example, to allow the boarding of this ship also in international waters for international uh, groups actually to assess what is on board. Uh, there has been not that many cases as yet, but uh, perhaps the most spectacular was actually a ship that was boarded in the Mediterranean, which actually turned out to be shipping uh, so-called Scud missiles uh, to Syria. Uh, to my knowledge, this happened a couple of years ago, and these missiles are still in the harbor in, in Greece, uh, waiting for to see what you could do with. But at least they were not; could, they did not uh, continue being shipped to, to Syria. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, I should know that, but I don't. I can't. I, I can't answer that. But it's, but uh, but but they were, but they were. Uh, what I do remember was that they were they were on their way to to Syria and they went uh, interfered. Uh, I think you, if if you recall the situation, uh, I think it was last summer with this Russian ship that was actually boarded by some commando outside of Gotland. Uh, of course, I mean uh, nothing has been ever established about any kind of weapons of mass destruction being on board that ship. But uh, I would not be surprised if uh, there were some such, such a situation, because if you look upon the very strong Russian interest in, in uh, finding this ship and getting it back into Russian harbor, I mean, you can only suspect what might have been on board that ship. But in a way, the good thing about it was actually that uh, the ship was returned to Russia and whatever was aboard was and then brought back uh, into, into Russia again. But we can only sort of have a hypothesis about what was on board that ship. Industry I've been talking about earlier as well, so I perhaps we're not going into all these details. But industry, of course, our cooperation with industry play a very important role. Uh, industry needs to play their part. I mean, just like the academic circus need to play their part. I mean, they need to be aware of the situation. They need to understand proliferation risks. They should have their documentation under control. They should be able to follow up on deliveries by verifying that products are actually being used for what they were intended to be used for, that uh, goods are not being diverted from a dairy production in, into uh, some kind of biologic production, biological, uh, bi biological um, weapons, anything like that. So it's a very important role that uh, uh, industry plays because, I mean, states have limited reach. Industry, of course, has a reach when they can actually go into the plants. I mean, they deliver the goods, they will return for service visits, etc. And then they can verify that these goods are actually being used in the proper fashion. Enforcement is, of course, also another matter which where we are cooperating with other agencies. And in this case, particularly uh, with, I mean, this project Aurora and the Bird were two projects where particular attention was focused on shipments from Sweden uh, to Iran. Basically, the whole contents of, uh, of, transport, of, of airplanes uh, that were going to Iran were investigated and uh, looked through to see that there was no goods that were not supposed to be on that ship, uh, or sorry, on that airplane. But of course, also in cooperation again with, with uh, the Swedish security police investigate suspect activities. And then, of course, I mean, to the extent that we do find uh, criminal activities, I mean, make certain that they are being processed and put into jail or whatever. But perhaps this is sort of, uh, so I'm talking about the problems of, of, of uh, non-proliferation efforts. This is perhaps the latest way of doing it. I don't know if you read about this, uh, what was called uh, Stuxnet virus. You read about that? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the belief, I mean, this Stuxnet virus affected some other uh, computer networks around the world, but it is believed that the focus actually was Iranian uh, uh, nuclear plants to stop. I mean, this is sort of the new type of warfare, something we of course need to all to be aware of because I mean, to the extent that this kind of viruses could be sent into Iran's uh, nuclear plants, of course, it could be used also for other purposes around the world and basically the digital warfare is sort of being talked about. I mean, some other countries have been hit by this as well. And of course, I mean, uh, let me say that uh, a virus 
is perhaps a better way to stop proliferation efforts than direct bombings that have been also proposed as far as Iran is concerned. And that has been advocated by, say, for example, Israel and by some quarters also in the United States. Yes, please. It seems like lots of things are going on that we don't know about. I mean, uh, if people actually attack each other with viruses and command arrays and ships, I mean, who are doing this? Are these like intelligence, intelligence agencies? Well, it, very, yeah, you're, you're quite right. I mean, lots of these things are going on. And I mean, it's, often it's very difficult to assess who is doing it. With this, I would not be surprised if it was turned out that these are sort of uh, based in the United States. Could be Israel as well, I don't know. You had another uh, similar attack on Estonia, uh, I think it was two years ago. And there it was established that most likely the source of these viruses actually uh, were in Russia, in Moscow. And I mean, this is something, I mean, I would say that the uh, knowledge on how to do this is increasing all the time. And for a nation like, uh, well, for any nation, Sweden, for example, I mean, uh, a key element is to make certain that our uh, networks cannot be hit by this kind of, of, of viruses. Which, of course, I mean, with increasing digitalization, increasing openness is, is very difficult. Well, because it's very difficult to assess, I mean, to confirm. I mean, also in the Estonian case, it's never been 100% confirmed that, that uh, Russia actually was behind it. And, and uh, I mean, in this case, I don't think you will ever get a confirmation either who is actually behind it. I mean, it's just like any kind of virus attack is, uh, I mean, even if it's just a basic hacker attack, I mean, can be very often be very difficult to to establish who actually is the culprit, and the same thing with this. I mean, this is more. I mean, the hackers, of course. I mean, know what <laughs> what 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 they are aiming at. I mean, it could be just to get into a secure network or whatnot, but this is a very professional way of doing it, where they actually have a particular target. In this case, Iranian nuclear program. But it's an interesting way. It's an interesting uh, new venue. And again, as I said, I mean, it seems if you want to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons, I would say this is, seems like a very much better way of doing it than, than, than bombing the nuclear plants in, in Iran. Don't you agree? Well, probably not as secure, though. <laughs> Of course, of course. Mm. But, 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 actually, but actually, I mean, the whole effort, as far as Iran is concerned, is, I mean, a realization that uh, Iran continues developing uh, their, 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 their nuclear programs. But I mean, to, to delay it in order to hopefully ca get some kind of agreement uh, with the country, some kind of peaceful agreement. And of course, I mean, the lots of efforts are going on in that, that way as well. So. Apart from what I've been uh, talking about, some efforts, I mean, what must be done. And here again, I quote uh, this excellent report. I mean, anyone interested in, in these issues should, of course, look at this uh, uh, committee report by uh, what's called the Blix Commission, but which also in, in a more proper word was uh, calling uh, the Weapons of Mass Destruction Committee. Uh, apart from Mr. Blix or Dr. Blix, there were 14 other well-known uh, uh, political profiles uh, from all around the world. And they actually have around, in the, that book, they actually make about six recommendations on how you should go forward. And these are just sort of the basic or the most important of them. Of course, I mean, you should agree internationally on, on uh, the general principles of action, I mean, which is, has to be done then by the United, United States Security Council. But then you should reduce the danger of the present ars uh, arsenal and make certain that uh, both that uh, states don't use these arsenals, that, ac that terrorists don't get access to these arsenals, which you can do th uh, through various measures uh, just by, by yeah, well, you can, you can read yourself here about what you can do, how you can do it. And of course, I mean, you must also prevent proliferation, no new weapon system, no new processors, prohibit test revive commitments, 
uh, negotiate with countries like Iran and North Korea. And of course also, which is very important, I mean this, that you negotiate international agreements for supply of uranium, uranium fuel and dispersal of spent fuel. Because as you know, I mean there is, there is I think, and that I, that I think is very important online. I mean, there's no direct link between civilian civilian nuclear energy and uh, and uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons. It is actually only when you r uh, process. I mean, the pr processing stage afterwards, which is dangerous, and that is why it is then pro proposed that that should be under international control, the processing, because then there is no risk that the spent energy or the spent uranium from nuclear power plants could be used for the production of bombs. So if you can agree upon that kind of thing, I mean, uh, the risk of proliferation will, will, will decrease. And then, of course, I mean, which is also important, prevent an arms race in space. So really, this is, uh, as you can recognize, uh, Hiroshima again. I will end where I started. And this, of course, is a peace monument in, in Hiroshima. This is, a, this is a process which was held on, 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 on the anniversary of, of, of the bombing of, of Hiroshima. And of course, I mean, the hope, the effort, of course, basic is that these weapons should never be used again that uh, they should be abandoned, they should disappear, they should, should not be used uh, by any either state or terrorist organization. But at the same time, I mean, we should also be aware that uh, while we're talking about these things, while we're trying to get agreement on the various treaties, while we're trying to get agreement on non-proliferation issues, at the same time we know that Iran is developing nuclear weapons, we know that North Korea has the weapons in several other countries as well. We know also that that day, when it is uh, just a moment, when it is acknowledged that Iran has the nuclear weapons, uh, when they uh, make the first explosion, we know also that there are a number of other countries in that region that will feel a need to develop their own weapons. Countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Egypt, etc. And of course, I mean, in such a vol volatile situation, the risk of actually these weapons being used increases very dramatically. Uh, Carl Bildt, our dear uh, foreign minister, not dear to everyone of course, but still, uh, our foreign minister, he actually in a in, in his, in, in his speech not long ago said, yes, most likely in our generation, talk about his generation, uh, we will die without having seen any full-blown nuclear conflict in the world, but I'm not so certain about our children. So these efforts that are going on to combat the proliferation flow, to stop the spread of nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction is extremely important. The nuclear Armageddon, as it was portrayed during the Cold War, might not be at the focus now, but the more limited conflict in the Middle East, for example, with the use of weapons of mass destruction is definitely there. And the risk, of course, also of terrorists getting their hands on not perhaps a full-blown nuclear device, but radioactive material that can be used in an attack on a major city in Europe or United States is definitely there as well. So we need to be very effective in our measures, in our work to protect mankind and ourselves from future problem from this kind of situation. And as for ISP, finally, of course, we, you need to visit our fabulous website where you can even further information on these issues that I've been discussing. So with that, uh, I come to the conclusion. And before we break for a coffee, I think you had a question or a comment. So please. Uh, what I said was not that we know, but I mean, there is a very strong suspicion that they're doing. I mean, they are refusing it. I mean, they are saying that they're not doing it, but there are enough indications 
as far as their, uh, their, their activities are concerned, as far as, the, I mean, there's been various proposals that the processing should be left to international community, which they are refusing. Uh, they are not acknowledging, I mean, the, as you might know, uh, they beat uh, a deadline uh, reasoned by IE, IAEA about declaring a new plant, an underground plant, that actually was a clandestine plant. So, I mean, there are, there are uh, I would say that there are uh, sufficient indications for the international community to conclude that, not unlikely, if I should be careful with the words, that Iran is developing nuclear weapons. I mean, you have also there, as you have a, a binding resolution of the United, Security, the United Nations Security Council, I mean, basically with, uh, of course, I mean, all the permanent members of the Un United Nations Security Council behind resolutions that actually are targets in Tehran to prevent the development of nuclear weapons. It's correct that uh, this one assessment, uh, which has been actually uh, went back a few years uh, with the indication that poss possibly Iran stopped the development back in 2004, something like that. But yeah, it's okay. But that the most likely that they are that they are continuing. Otherwise, they could be more open as far as uh, inspections by the IAEA is concerned, etc. So I mean the likelihood. The, the, uh, I mean there's no certainty, but the likelihood is is very great, and the world community is reacting to this very uh, almost certainty that this is going on. When so it come, when it comes to inspection uh, and IAEA, the country that has allowed the most inspections and most intrusive inspe inspections are Iran. Like right now we have IAEA inspectors on the ground and there's cameras set up in in the nuclear facilities and everything is being weighed and, uh, and measured to make sure that there is no diversion. And during this whole time, IEA has confirmed that there is no diversion. So what can Iran do to prove that they are not making a nuclear weapon short of, uh, short of saying no to their right to peaceful nuclear energy, which they have under the NPT? Mm -hmm. What can they do? Well, they can cooperate with the international community. More than? Yeah, more than, they are, more than they're doing. And they actually, they can also allow, which has been, uh, which has been proposed to them, to send, uh, uh, not to uh, reprocess uh, uh, spent uranium in uh, Iran, but sending, uh, sending it abroad, which has been offered to them. Uh, they have actually allowed, I mean, there was an agreement, as you might know, in, uh, made in Turkey together with the Turkey and, and Brazil. But that was only for a very, I mean, the, that was based on uh, a proposal that had been made uh, some years ago uh, for a very limited amount of, of, of spent fuel that were going to be reprocessed. But the point is that since then, they developed very much more. So, I mean, it would only take a very small part of what they actually do have for the building of, of, nuclear, uh, of, of nuclear devices. Yeah. Now, we have some more issues, we have more questions uh, uh, behind there. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, it was some. Uh, well, this was quite recent, actually. But I read in the newspaper that uh, Iran had actually showed a prototype of a new war robot. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I don't quite get uh, get, get you what to say. Yeah, I read an article this summer. And yes. Uh, it was about Iran actually showing a prototype for a new weapon they were developing. Were they, de were they developing missiles? Actually, yes. Yes, yeah. that's correct. But I mean, they've not. Com uh, well, I mean, they don't. Uh, what I understand, in a way, they don't have uh, sort of the capacity to c combine. I mean, uh, first of all, whether they have a nuclear. I mean, they don't have the nuclear weapon as yet. That is very clear. But uh, they don't have the. C they don't have the capacity set either to combine uh, such a weapon and missile. So we're, they are still. I mean, the uh, assessment is that this is still a few years ahead. Uh. And these are some, some food for thought during the coffee break, but we'll get back to that and other ideas as well after the break. Okay, is it three o'clock? Yeah, three o'clock. And also, meanwhile, while uh, you are having a break, uh, this is one of the more bizarre, what you call the coffee, uh, co uh, coffee table books I've seen. Actually, this is actually all the open air nuclear. Uh, explosions by the United States between 1945 and uh, 1963. I think when when you had the the the, the, the when you stopped actually open air 
explosions. So anyone who wants to look at this uh, can take a look at that. And of course also this book is uh, where I have all these uh, proposals and efforts. Thank you.